don't know what I Love Cinema is, it's like, hey, how are you? Hey, Strider, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm going to be talking about um, the latest movies I've seen, movies in the UK cinema. Um, and I'm going to be talking about some uh, film news, cinema news, movie news. Ah, oh, good to hear you're good, mate. Um, and then I'm going to be reviewing three films today. Uh, if you're following me on Twitter, you probably know which films these are because I put out a poll um, to see what you think, um, which of these three films that I've seen yesterday, I did a bit of a marathon, um, which of these three films is going to be my movie of the week. And I was quite surprised by the film that I've decided is my movie of the week. So um, let me just have a look at the poll. Let's see what the results are. Okay, seven people voted. Thank you very much. What films? Yeah, you will have to stay tuned for that one. Um, or check out I Love Cinema Vlog on Twitter. I put out the poll. Okay, let me just say the poll. Okay, so I posted it yesterday, went to the cinema, and I saw three films. Black Klansman, that one. Happy Time Murders, and Alpha. These were the films that I watched yesterday, and I put out a poll um, asking which one do you guys think I enjoyed the most, which one do you think is kind of like my movie of the week. And a uh, bunch of people, 29% of people were saying Black Klansman, 29% were saying Happy Time Murders, and 42% were saying Alpha. So stay tuned for later on in the show when I will be talking about each of these films, and at the end I will tell you which of these I enjoyed the most. And then we'll see whether the poll was accurate or not. And let's have a quick look whether we... Well, obviously I'm live. Thank you very much, uh, Strider, for commenting. Um, let's just see whether this is all good on Twitter. I assume you're watching on Periscope. So let's just see. I, I don't really know Periscope very well. Your guess is happy murder time. Okay. Good guess. 33% 33 cha 33 chance of, of having it right. Okay, so it looks like... Oh, that's a great screen cap of me holding my nose. Perfect. Um, yeah, I have a bit of sniffle, so apologies for that. Um, and yeah, I will be checking out whether this is all working. Hopefully it is. But let me dive straight into film news. There's actually quite a lot of stuff happening. So the first bit is Crazy Rich Asians. Uh, you've probably heard of this film if you're in the US. It came out, I think, a week ago. It's fairly new. It's not hit UK cinemas yet. But I've just found out that there's going to be an unlimited screening for Cineworld Unlimited card holders on Saturday evening at 8pm. I've just booked my ticket. I'm really excited for this particular film. I hear it's really, really good. And it's that good, actually. It had such a good opening weekend in the US. Uh, not just opening weekend, opening first week, you could say. That... Warner Brothers has already commissioned a sequel. So they're moving forward with a crazy rich Asian sequel with director John M. Chu, who's also directed the first one, um, and the same writers are on board. Apparently the film already made $34 million in just, what, five days? So it's quite successful. Captain from Star Trek's in it. Um, is, that, is that Captain from Star Trek's in it? What, Chris Pine? Is in Crazy Rich, Rich Asians. I didn't know that. Oh, cool. I like Chris Pine. Um, so I didn't know that he was in... Oh, no. Yes, no. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Oh, do you mean the Asian guy from... Not Pine. What other captain? The lady. What, from Star Trek Discovery? I like this. Periscope is a lot better. People are actually commenting. I love it. The lady from Star Trek. I hope it's... Yeah, from Star Trek Discovery. Yeah, right. I think she has one of the leads. I think I read somewhere that they postponed shooting the film so they could make sure that she could actually be part of the film, which I think is wicked. Mm. Love Star, uh, Star Trek Discovery, and she's amazing in it. So they're already making a sequel. It's obviously a really cool thing. That's it, Giorgio, Captain Giorgio. That's it. Um, I almost wanted to comment on spoilers for potentially the end of the first season of Star Trek Discovery. In case you haven't seen it yet, I'm not going to be spoiling that. Um, so they're already making uh, or thinking about making a sequel, which I think is fantastic, because uh, 
I love it when films um, depict minorities because minorities, well, they're minorities for a reason, why we don't really see them much. Uh, I'm part of a minority too uh, because I'm gay and, uh, well, I want to say and a woman, but actually women are not the minority, are we? But uh, according to cinema, we are because we're hardly in any films, right? But seeing Asian leads, seeing black, uh, black American leads, African leads, uh, Latino leads, I think that's amazing. Another film that's coming out tomorrow, um, speaking of Asian-led films, is Searching, which is also uh, with someone from Star Trek, um, John Chu, and he's fantastic in that. I've seen Searching a few weeks ago. It's really, really good. So please make sure that you go out to the cinema and watch Searching. Once um, Crazy Rich Asians hits us, that should be really good. Um, I really, I am excited for this particular film. Who? Who? Um, oh, John Chu in Searching. Um, he plays, oh, not Chekhov, the other guy. Um, Sulu. He plays Sulu in Star Trek, uh, in, in the movies, the new movies. Um, and he's the lead in that. Yeah, exactly, Sulu. He's really good in searching. It's a really great film. You need to check it out, mate. I think you'd li you're going to like that, Strider. Uh, moving on from uh, Asian films, um, which, you know, I'm so excited for this. Seriously, bring on Saturday evening. New Star Wars casting, just quickly. Dominic Monaghan from, uh, obviously, famously from Lord of the Rings or from Lost, if you've seen that. And Doctor Who, Matt Smith, have now joined um, Star Wars, the next Star Wars installment, directed again by J.J. Abrams. Thank God. Um, Smith apparently in a really key role, but no one's telling us what role he's playing, what role Monaghan is playing. So there's a lot of people getting attached to this film. Um, it's coming out next Christmas, so I'm really excited for that because uh, if you've seen any of my previous broadcasts, I'm not a huge fan of The Last Jedi. I was very disappointed with that. I have a, I have a very love-hate-hate -hate relationship with it and would like to sit down with Ryan Johnson and talk about things. Um, so I'm hoping that J.J. Abrams brings it back on track. In other kind of blockbuster news, Kristen Stewart reveals how the Charlie's Angels reboot will be different from the previous versions. Really not sure where they are going with Star Wars story. Yeah, exactly. Ryan Johnson just left it open, which, um, I mean, I am a fan of open-ended films. Very open for interpretation. I, I do like that. I just didn't like some of the stuff that he's done in the film, what he did with Snoke and... Some of the stuff he did with Ray, separating Ray and Finn, I think was a was a shitty idea. I didn't like the entire subplot with Finn and Rose, even though I like both of these characters. I didn't like their subplots in the film, and yeah, there's like I could do an entirely separate broadcast, a one-hour broadcast, just sharing my thoughts on the Last Jedi because there are bits in the film that I really love. But there are also, unfortunately, more bits that I really hate. So overall, I was not very happy with that film. So back to Charlie's Angels. So um, we all know there's going to be a new Charlie's Angels. Um, Elizabeth Banks is directing it. She co-wrote the script. Kristen Stewart is one of the three angels starring in it. And Stewart now spoke to Entertainment Tonight... And she was kind of giving some, not a lot of detail about what they're doing, but she was saying we're not trying to do an impression of the last one, Charlie's Angels and Charlie's Angels Full Throttle. I love the first Charlie's Angels. The second one, not so much. And Stuart was saying the reimagining that they're trying to do is so grounded and well-intentioned and really shows the way women can work together now. Oh, yeah, I saw that stuff about Star Trek. Yeah, Chris Pine and Hemsworth are potentially not coming back so that's going to be interesting um so really well intention really shows the way women can work together it tries to be warm and funny but it lacks a kitsch element that we have seen before that works so well so it's, it's funny that she says that it lacks the kitsch element when she also comments that this kitsch element actually works so well so it's going to be interesting to see whether they're trying to do it like a serious approach to, to charlie's angels the next Charlie's Angels is coming out, scheduled currently for September next year. But if not even started production yet, it's in pre-production. So uh, Kristen Stewart was mentioning that she's going through like some fight training and just like getting fit and you know getting getting stuff sorted and getting prepared for her role. 
Um, the leads are Kristen Stewart and oh, the chick from the new Power Rangers movie. And the other one I can't remember. I'm still a bit bummed that Lupita Nyong'o apparently is not part of the cast. Um, let me just have a look. Let's see what it says. The one thing, I want to see it. Um, like, it doesn't matter what I hear about Charlie's Angels. I want to see it because I love the uh, the story of Charlie's Angels. I like the idea of Charlie's Angels. I still remember the TV series that I grew up with as a kid. Charlie's Angels reboot. Naomi Scott, I think she's the one from the Power Rangers film. And Ella Belinska, I have no idea who that is. Oh, thank you, mate. Every Thursday, 8 p.m., come join me. Um... And I like interacting with people, like people that are commenting in the chat and stuff. I think that's wicked. Oh, what did I do with my notes? <laughs> there we go. Um, so it sounds like this one's going to be grounded a bit more in reality, but I do hope that they're not forgetting about the fun element as well. Oh, thanks for the hearts, everyone. Um, so Banks, like I mentioned, is directing, and she's co she also co-wrote the script. She is also going to star as Bosley, which is also something that we haven't seen uh, 8 p.m. UK time. Yeah, that's my time. Where are you, mate? Where are you, Strider? Um, so she's also going to be starring as Bosley, and we've usually had Bosley uh, played by a man. Um, yeah, see you in a second, mate. And um, he was played by Bill Murray in the first one, and I thought Bill Murray, Murray was funny. I really, really liked him. I mean, who doesn't like Bill Murray, right? Um, and then uh, I think it was Bernie Mac in the second one, just not as good. It was it was going a bit too silly for my personal taste. Um, but I still, I like both of these films. So I can't wait to see this more potentially grounded um, reiteration of it or a new interpretation of it. So the previous synopsis that was um, thrown around for this new Charlie's Angels film was saying um, that we're going to be following a next generation of angels working for the mysterious Charlie. And uh, we don't know who Charlie is yet, so that's apparently still going to be probably a male voice coming out of the speaker, I would assume. But since the original films, the Townsend Agency, so Charlie Townsend, right? The Townsend Agency has grown considerably and gone global, providing security and intelligence services to a wide variety of private clients with offices and highly trained teams worldwide now the worldwide is new this film focuses on one of those teams which is probably going to be american based and is scheduled like i said for a theatrical distribution september 2019 so i'm really excited for that one because obviously i'm a woman i like seeing female leads on uh, on the big screen or anywhere really to be quite honest i love kristen stewart um i think she's a great actress i know there's a lot of people that disagree but <laughs> It's my personal opinion. I like seeing her. I don't like all of the films that she does, but Charlie's Angels as itself, as an idea, I like. Like I said, I like the TV series back in the, what was it, the 70s or something? Um, I like the reboots. Hey, mate, welcome back. I like the reboots they've done with Drew Barrymore and Cameron Diaz and Lucy Liu. They were a lot of fun. It was the campier version, even. But it. I think it worked. Um... So I really can't wait to see this. September next year, so keep my fingers crossed. And now on to a bit of potentially darker news, or kind of like good news, actually. Um, a few weeks ago, I think I mentioned that Jessica Chastain... Oh, you're in the US. Wow, what time is it there? Is it like lunchtime or something? Um, Jessica Chastain is uh, scheduled to make an action movie called Eve, in which she's apparently playing some kind of like assassin or something. And uh, one of the things why it got a lot of headlines as soon as it was announced is because the director that was announced with it, called, a guy called Matthew Newton, he was the original director for Eve, and he ended up stepping down from the project after fans started a petition online. There was this huge outcry, outcry because... Oh, I don't know if it's based on a video game, Eve. Um, if it is, I've not heard of this video game. I mean, I, I am also like a bit of a gamer, but I've nev not heard of that. Unless it's Eve Online, and I don't think that that has an assassin, assassin in it. Um, but there was this huge fan outcry about Matthew Newton making this film, because there were allegations about domestic violence against him a few years ago, and uh, he's now stepped down, or he was stepped down, and... Um, Tate Taylor, who Chastain has worked on 
on The Help, for which he was nominated for an Oscar, he's now swooped in basically as the new director. Are you upside down? Oh shit, am I upside down? Really? Oh, it, I don't know, it looks normal here. I don't know, this is the second time I've tried Periscope, so if I'm upside down, that would be hilarious. I'm not in Australia. I'm just in the UK. Let's see what it does. Now, it looks normal on my end. Are you watching on Twitter? Let's see. I mean, the stuff on Twitter is not even moving, but if I click on the Periscope thing, then it gets me into Periscope and that looks normal. So I'm not sure. Oh, you're on your phone, but it's upside down. That's a bit rubbish then. I wonder why that is. If you turn your phone the other way, 180, is it automatically readjusting me so I'm still upside down? That would be interesting to see. Um, on Twitter, it's not actually playing the video. Maybe you have to click on this. Oh, you have to click on this. I've never used this before, so I really don't know. <laughs> no, on Twitter it doesn't actually play. You have to click on the Periscope app. Oh, what was Yappus for? As in, you turn it 180 and it still readjusts? That's interesting. Are you watching on the Periscope app, or how are you watching it? So that would be interesting to see. But yeah, the, like I said, let me try to fix it. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Um, so there was this outcry because there were these allegations um, against Matthew Newton by a former partner about Periscope. Oh, interesting. Um, that um, because of domestic violence and considering how outspoken Jessica Chastain is um, in the Me Too um, movement and everything, it was quite surprising that um, he has been attached to the project in the first place. But ever since uh, the Hollywood Reporter is reporting after the original announcement, uh, announcement of the project and Matthew uh, Newton, a CARE 2 petition was circulated asking Jessica Chastain, who is this vocal, excuse me, vocal proponent of the Time's Up movement, she dropped Newton from the film. Apparently in 2010, the Australian filmmaker's then fiance Rachel Taylor accused him of two unprovoked assaults and was granted a two-year domestic violence order against him, an order he apparently later breached. And yeah, given how outspoken Chastain is, I was surprised that um, he was attached to the project in the first place. He now um, got dumped or he stepped back, whatever it is, and now Chastain is reuniting with Taylor. And it's going to be, hopefully, a good movie. Uh, it's interesting that Taylor, who's done The Help, I'm not entirely sure what other movies he's done, but um, directing an action flick, uh, considering The Help's not really an action flick, is interesting. Um, so I can't wait to see that. It's a movie I will be watching anyway, because I love Jessica Chastain. Anything. Welcome back, Strider. Am I still upside down? Am I upside down? Right side up now. I love being the right side up. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I can't wait to see Eve, because I will watch any movie Jessica Chastain is in. I don't really care if it's a good movie or a bad movie, she's awesome. So, there we go. And now this one, this headline kind of made me chuckle a bit. Um, and I'm also excited for this. Dwayne Johnson. Everyone knows Dwayne Johnson. The Rock's awesome, right? Who doesn't love The Rock? He's churning out movie after movie after movie. It's just ridiculous. You think you've just seen Rampage and then there's a skyscraper ready for you. It's like, what? He can't wait to be king. I just can't wait to be king. Apparently, King Kamehameha, which is the bit that made me chuckle because I used to watch Dragon Ball, and there's this whole Kamehameha, yeah, whatever, you need to watch it, um, with Robert Zemeckis. So, according to Deadline, Warner Brothers Pictures and New Line Cinema have landed a script for King, which is an epic feature that will feature Dwayne Johnson in the lead role as Hawaiian King Kamehameha, and the film will be by, directed by Robert Zemeckis, which is kind of exciting. Um, but then you go as like King Kamehameha, who is King Kamehameha? Other than, am I watching a Dragon Ball movie with The Rock in it? I'd watch that. I'd watch that, seriously. According to the Hawaiian Islands Tourism page, a great warrior, diplomat, and leader, King Kamehameha, 
united the Hawaiian Islands into one royal kingdom in 1810, after years of conflict. Kamehameha was uh, the first, apparently, there might have been several, was destined for greatness from birth. Hawaiian legend prophesied that a light in the sky with feathers like a bird would signal the birth of a great chief. Historians believe Kamehameha was born in 1758, the year Haley's Comet passed over Hawaii. Sounds kind of cool. Sounds kind of epic. It's got the rock attached to it. I can't wait for this. This is going to be awesome. Um, Deadline also mentions in the article that this story is apparently really dear to Dwayne Johnson's heart. Uh, he's previously mentioned this, that he wanted to make this story happen, make the story into a movie. Back in the day when he was just starting out as an actor, when he was playing the Scorpion King in the, in the second Mummy film, you know, The Mummy Returns, that was like about 20 years ago or something. So back then, he wanted to tell this story. And I think it is fantastic that this is now actually happening. Um, anything that The Rock is in, I will pretty much watch because it's just always a lot of fun. Um, and you know, if you've seen my show from uh, when I was talking about Rampage, I mentioned how The Rock got the ending of the movie changed because he feared, oh well, <laughs> he didn't fear. Does the guy fear anything? Um, he was under the impression that um, the original ending of the script was not what people would expect from a film that he's in because he thinks that his branding, his what he stands for, is good family entertainment. There's always a happy end and stuff like that. So the original ending for Rampage was very different from what we've actually seen in the cinema. And after reading about it, I, um, I mean, I was talking about this on the show as well, I I did say it's like I do agree with him. It's like if I prefer the ending that Rampage has now, I didn't like the ending that they were apparently having in the script um, originally. So I do agree that The Rock usually stands for certain entertainment. It's usually light-hearted entertainment, even if there is a lot of action. But it is family-friendly. You can take kids to a rock movie all the time. So. I it will be interesting to see whether this is going to be the same for Kamehameha. I mean, if he's like reuniting different islands, that reuniting under one banner is usually not a very let's sit together and sip tea kind of a affair. It's usually a I'll bash your head your head in until I win kind of an affair. So it, it could potentially be quite violent, but it's still a rock movie. So it'll be interesting to see how they deal with that. Okay, that's 24 minutes in. That's all the mo uh, movie news I have for today. I want to talk about the first few films. The first film I'm talking about is Black Klansman. Hey, Strider, welcome back. I hope it's not my connection that you're getting disconnected or something. Hope it's all good. Um, Black Klansman, in case you don't know what this is about, synopsis. We have a guy called Ron Stallworth an African-American police officer from Colorado successfully manages to infiltrate the local Ku Klux Klan with the help of a white surrogate who eventually becomes head of the local branch. Is that actually right? I got this off IMDb, but now I'm thinking about it. It's like, nah, that's not entirely accurate. But we basically have the lead guy. <laughs> I was like, no, this way, the lead guy. Ron Stallworth, who is played by John David Washington, who is Denzel Washington's son. Um, and it's quite obvious that he's Denzel Washington's son. He's, he carries himself with like this, the same kind of like charm and, and confidence. And it's like, you can tell that he's like a Denzel, you know, um, or a Denzel in the making. He's really good. He's very charming. He's very captivating. Um, I did like his performance. I like the performances pretty much of everybody in the film. Uh, Adam Driver stars in it, Topher Grace and Alec Baldwin as well. Um, especially the stuff with, um, I mean, there's a lot of really good stuff in this movie. But one of the things that kind of, it sets an interesting tone because I have very really mixed feelings about this film, which is interesting considering I know I'm almost a week late with reviewing this. Um, and I, I've heard from everyone and their dog how amazing this film is 
and how important and the message and just awesome and this is what everyone talks about at the water cooler and blah 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 so my expectations were like through the roof and I went to see this and it starts out fantastic Kylo Ren no he's not KKK <laughs> Everyone's saying the same thing. <laughs> no, Kylo Ren is not KKK. Well, sort of. Depends. Um, I will... By the way, I'm, I'm trying not to spoil anything. Like all the films that I talk about, I try not to spoil anything. So don't worry about any spoilers. Um, I usually tend to not put any spoilers in my broadcast because I want you guys to go to the cinema and watch films that I recommend and potentially stay away from films that I go like, do not bother. Um, so with this one, um, we have Ron Stallworth, who is the first African-American police officer in the Colorado Springs Police Department. It's a, it's a huge thing. It's almost, it feels like a quota guy, you know, it's like the, the, the film takes place in the 60s, which was obviously a decade huge for the civil rights movement, which is exactly why this film takes place in the 60s. Apparently it's also based on a true story, which is what I did not know um, about. And that was, um, that gives it kind of an interesting perspective or gave me an interesting perspective for some of the things that I potentially had a bit of a problem with in this film. Oh yeah, by the way, famously it is directed by Spike Lee. Um, so for that, by the way, you basically just already have to see it. Um, but the way that the film starts out and really got me in the mood uh, as to what kind of film you're watching, I think that at about the first five minutes is just, you see like an old school projector, a projected image of some kind of video footage. And then you have Alec Baldwin step in front of it, starting to spout some white supremacist bullshit. And you can tell after like a few seconds that he's trying to record a propaganda video with that projection stuff behind him. And because every now and then he, he flops a line or something, he goes, ah, okay, let's do that again. <coughs> <coughs> Does something with his vocal cords or whatever and starts the entire, the entire thing again. And the way that he does it is really funny and entertaining to the audience but you can tell how fucked up and i mean upsetting it is what you actually see him do it's it's like hitler trying to record a propaganda video for the nazis you know and it sets a really interesting tone and um i really i really enjoyed that so i was like in in that kind of a mood it's like okay so you're you're going to spout all this shit and, and we're going to like twist it and turn it and kind of like make it funny or hilarious, ridiculous, kind of like get out, you know, where they're trying to bring a message across, but also try to make it funny and entertaining for the audience, but not for the people involved in the film. Right. And that is what I thought this kind of movie was going to be. And unfortunately it wasn't um, because then we, we have to set up with Baldwin, which I thought was superb, absolutely superb. I'm a huge fan of the first five minutes of the film and the last five minutes of the film. Like, perfect bookends, absolutely brilliant. But what happens in between, for whatever reason, does not really work for me. And I was, I was really, really surprised by that. Um, so we have Ron rock up at the police department um, because he's seen some kind of a job ad somewhere. Ah, oh, cheers, mate. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, oh, by the way, let's see if this is all good. I haven't checked that yet. Ah, oh, cheers, mate. All right. Thank you very much. It's working. I do appreciate uh, that. Thank you. Ah, I turn it off. I turn it off. Okay. I might be articulate, but I'm not very tech savvy. Um, so he rocks up at the police department and it's the 60s, so this whole civil rights movement stuff, there's not a lot of representation and he becomes the first African-American police officer um, in the Colorado Springs Police Department, as I said earlier. And obviously he's met with a lot of racism there. It's like there's racism that they bring up in this film that I've never even heard of. It must be dated um, because this takes place in the 60s. 
um, he like black people get called toads and I'd never heard this before but the way that it's put into the film it is so obvious that what this person is calling him is a racial slur um, or it's most definitely derogatory so it works in that in that regard um, so he doesn't have a lot of friends he's the only black man and like that must be so so weird and, and, and horrible like if you're the first for anything and it's just so uncomfortable right but he's very um, he, he's very career oriented and he, he wants to do better and they, they put him, because he's a rookie, they put him in the archive room or the filing room or whatever. And he's not happy with it. And he's like, I'm a cop. I want to be a cop. And there's like a lot of shit happening. But at the end of the day, he's still a rookie. And people tell him he's a rookie. He literally just started. He just walked in with his lunchbox. You know, that that's kind of like how early he is in his career. And then all of a sudden he manages to be part of a special investigations unit. And you've probably seen the trailer for the film and he, he calls the Ku Klux Klan and they then go, yeah, exactly. That's why the film is so powerful, Strider, because the parallelism from what happened in the 60s to what is currently happening now, especially in the US, um, that is what this film is about. And the film depicts that really well. It's showing you things and it's talking about things that are happening that you go as like, it doesn't feel date like I see that the people I'm watching are cl it's clearly a period piece it takes place in the 60s I can tell from the way people look what they wear the kind of cars they drive however what I see happening is what I see happening on the news right now and that is why this film is so important and so timely and people need to go and see it now I think this is a good movie Unfortunately, I don't think it's a great movie because there's a lot of fat in this film that I would have trimmed. There's a lot, it, the film suffers from a lot of pacing issues, which is very unfortunate because all the performances are really well done. Um, especially Washington and Driver, they, they drive the entire film. They, these two work so well together. I really loved seeing them together. Um, Washington, and if you've seen the trailer, he ends up calling the Ku Klux Klan. And because he can speak what we here in the UK call posh English, he sounds like a white person on the phone. He doesn't sound like a brother. Yeah, see, that is something that, that also really makes me wonder that people don't see history repeating itself, Strider. The parallels between what's currently going on with your white supremacy uh, movement in the US and Hitler in the 30s is exactly the same. Uh, they're even using the same rhetoric and, and people are just not seeing it. It's just so baffling. And that's why a film like Black Klansman is just so so timely because we are repeating history. It's like you would think that 50 years later we would be so much further in regards to equality and civil rights. And that is what films like Black Klansman or which I think is the superior film Get Out from last year from Jordan Peele who also produced this by the way um, these films are so important and powerful because the same shit is happening again right now it's like time stood still it's absolutely ridiculous and that is why these films are so important and that's why I feel a bit bad for not liking this film more for not being more profoundly moved by the film and one of the biggest problems I have with Black Klansmen is that the message is great. The film, unfortunately, is not. And I am not emotionally invested in what is going on. And that sounds so stupid and harsh, considering that I'm a huge proponent of civil rights and equality. Um, and these things are very important to me and very dear to my heart. Um, but the stuff in this film, I had a hard time emphasizing with anything that Ron was going through because you never get to know him and he's the protagonist and if you never get to know him that is a huge problem if I'm not emotionally involved with the lead or at least someone slightly important in the film then I'm emotionally distant to what's going on in the film and that means that the film for whatever reason it just won't work for me I just I just don't care and considering all the stuff that's depicted in the film, that is just atrocious to me. 
you know it is a very good message Strider and it's a very important message and that's why I think everyone needs to go and see this but there, there are things in this film um, Harry Belafonte for example thank you I appreciate that you understand what I'm saying um, but there's a scene for example where Harry, Harry Belafonte is in this film he has one scene and he is um, reminiscing or retelling something that happened in his childhood to one of his childhood friends or someone he knew uh, who was another black man who was uh, mentally disabled or a bit backwards, whatever you, however the politically correct term for that is. Um, and he was accused of raping a white woman. Uh, apparently he didn't do it, but the white folks didn't care. They took him and then they do horrendous things to him. And this is a really powerful scene. I don't want to give too much away here because I want this to have an effect on you. I don't want to spoil this for you. Um, and it is supposed to be a very powerful scene. And I still remember every single detail that he mentions that happened to this young man before he was eventually killed or how he was killed. But I had... I was, it sounds weird, I was intellectually shocked by what I was hearing, but I wasn't emotionally, I wasn't emotionally shocked, I wasn't, I wasn't distressed, I wasn't crying, I wasn't outraged, I wasn't, it was all in my brain and not in my heart, and that is usually something that doesn't happen to me, and I was like, why is that? And it's because Spike Lee, for this particular sequence, chose not to show what happens to the young man. And I can understand why, because obviously a lot of people would say this is gory and violent for no particular reason, this is gratuitous violence, this is exploitation. You don't need to show these kinds of things. However, I happen, personal opinion, I happen to, everything here is my personal opinion, I happen to disagree with that. For me personally, there's nothing more powerful than seeing video footage, even if it is fictionalized of something horrendous happening when you're trying to bring the point across that this is outrageous, atrocious, horrendous and should not be happening. You sometimes need to shock people into understanding and I firmly believe in that. Um, and the film later on at the very end, I mentioned the last five minutes and the first five minutes were very, very emotionally charged for me, especially the last five minutes. Spike Lee chooses to include some archive footage of actual news events. Um, and I had seen all of this footage before, but because I was seeing it and I was seeing people's response to it, the entire film I was not emotionally charged whatsoever. I was not there emotionally for the film. I was very, very distant, which is so weird to me. But in the last five minutes I lost the plot. I, I cried my eyes out, I was a fucking mess, because the stuff that he chose to show in the last five minutes was horrible. And because, and I'd seen it before and I still remember watching it, it's like it's so, so horrible, the stuff that you see there. It gets to me just thinking of it right now. And, and that's exactly what I mean, I'm having an emotional response just to that, just thinking of it. Whereas when I think to the Harry Belafonte scene, which is retelling something even more atrocious, so much more atrocious, but because we didn't see it, I have no, no emotional response to it, which is really bizarre to me. Um, like I said, I had an intellectual response and an intellectual shock to that, but not an emotional one. Um, and I think that's kind of like how I would summarize the film. It's like I was emotionally quite distant. I was just taking it in. It's like reading about injustice and, and, and civil rights and inequality and all of that stuff in a history book. It's very emotionally detached. Whereas what the film, I think, film always should do and usually does is show you stuff that you would otherwise not see. And that is how you get the emotional response. That's how it's more intimate. That's how it's more personal. That's how you, as a viewer, take it personal. How you relate and understand something that you will never be part of. I'm, I'm not black. I will never have to go through that shit. But I've seen other films that are depicting these things. And then I understand. 
yeah, racism and hatred. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. I mean, I get, I get hatred in other ways because I'm gay. Um, so there's that. But I will never know what it's like to be black. Um, and there's another scene in the film where you have two black men and two black women uh, in a car and they get pulled over by police. And nothing horrible really happens there. I mean, the entire thing that they're being harassed already is horrible. The worst thing that happens there is that one of the white cops gropes one of the black women. And that is kind of harmless when you think about all the other shit that happens, right? So it was quite interesting to see what Spike Lee chose to show and what he chose to just have someone talk about and then what he chose to show again. Interestingly enough, um, he also included footage from a rather infamous film called The Birth of a Nation. Uh, if you don't know what that is, Google that. Um, it's a very, very famous film from, what's it, the 20s or something? Um, it is, it's basically a white supremacist, racist piece of shite. Um, I've never personally seen it. They did a, a remake uh, in the last few years. I can't remember who was the lead in that. All I remember is that at the time there were allegations because of some abuse by that lead, uh, which is why the film pretty much tanked and disappeared at the box office and no one ever talked about it ever again. Um, I didn't personally see it, so I don't know. But I've never seen footage of the original film, which is, I think, from the 20s. And the stuff that Lee chose to show in this film was really interesting and also how he put it together with the reaction of the, the Ku Klux Klan members and, and stuff like that. There's a lot of parallel montages going on that I think work really well. He used a split screen uh, every now and then, which I think is very powerful. We, we kind of like lost that in movies where we don't do that anymore, which is kind of a shame because what it allows you to do is two people have a conversation and what usually happens is you have a close-up of one person and then you cut to the other. But with the split screen, you can see one person on the left, one person on the right, and you see both reactions simultaneously. And that can be quite powerful. And it works really well in this film, and I really, really enjoyed that. I thought that was quite an, an interesting tool um, to show all of that. Overall, I like this film. It's a good, it's a decent film, but it's not as great as everyone is making it up to be as a film. The story, the message, the importance of the message and what it's trying to tell us, that is great. That is important. That is why you need to go and see it and, and just forgive it that the film is too long. 135 minutes, this film is too long. I don't mind a three hour movie, but it needs to be tight. And that's one thing that this film is not tight. There's a lot of fat here that I would trim to make it a bit more, you know, it, it feels like you're watching a film from the 70s or 60s. They were quite elongated. They don't work nowadays. They don't work as well with nowadays audiences. We're, we're used to fast paced stuff, quick edits and all of that. And this film is nothing like that. Uh, it really takes its time with certain things and I found that potentially a bit problematic. I love the performances, everyone is fantastic, especially Washington and Driver. One of the biggest problems I have with the film is that they're on this case, they start investigating the Ku Klux Klan and there is no uh, 1 to 10. I, I hate 1 to 10 scales. I usually go, I would recommend or I wouldn't recommend. Um, on a 1 to 10, I would probably give it a 6 as a movie. I do not think that it's a great movie. It's, it's a decent movie, but there's a lot of issues with it. But that's just my personal opinion. My mate who I went with, he really liked it. Um, but we both agreed that it has huge pacing issues. And there are bits um, in there that make it almost boring. Um, so it feels rather lengthy and because it is over two hours it is kind of hard to digest which is a bit annoying um, but overall the biggest problem I have is they're on this case and at the very end the climax or resolution or whatever you want to call it is not really a climax or resolution you don't there's no satisfaction in we've just solved the case or we put the Ku Klux Klan behind bars or at least one of them behind, or we made a difference somehow. 
you don't really feel like they made a difference. One thing that they managed to achieve is they, they saved some black students from being blown up. But that wasn't actually the reason why they started to investigate the Ku Klux Klan. The entire time you feel like they're after the head of the Ku Klux Klan, who also comes to Colorado. But then nothing happens with that either. It's just like a mouthpiece here and a mouthpiece, mouthpiece there. So it was really, really bizarre. It was like, what was the whole point? Now, it's based on a real story, on a true story. Now, I don't know exactly what this true story was. At the very near the end of the film, everything becomes very really over the top and over dramatized and felt very really unrealistic to me that I was half expecting our newly black rookie officer to just wake up from a daydream on his desk and we're like, oh my God, it was all a dream. And then he goes back to the filing cabinet which is not the case but it was very it was very over stylized over the top that i just couldn't take it seriously and maybe i mean it is kind of like in tune with films that were done in the 50s and 60s which is why i'm not a huge fan of films being done in the 50s and 60s because they were very stylized and over the top they just don't feel very real and nowadays we're very very much into realistic and naturalistic acting and situations and that is not what this film necessarily depicts which was quite interesting and a bit alien and I've been talking about this way too long so <laughs> sorry um, overall I think it's a good it's a good movie I would give it <laughs> like you said on a scale of 1 to 10 I would probably give it a 6 in regards to its message I would give it a 9 um, because people need to see it it's very powerful but the problem is it's not as powerful as it could have been after I've seen the entire film I was like well does anyone remember Get Out from the guy who produced this? Because Get Out did the same thing and the same message, but better and more entertaining. Um, so I have very mixed feelings about this film. And I kind of feel bad because considering the message of the film and how important it is to, to watch something like this and to be aware of the bloody parallels from the 60s to now. It's like we have brought the 60s into the 2010s. You know, what we're doing to the black community or to any non-white community is just fucking horrendous. And can we just wake the fuck up because this is not okay. Um, so watch this. Even if the film needs a bit of work, I think you need to go and support this. And I do hope uh, also if you want to be able to talk to anybody at the water cooler because this is what people are talking about. So go and see this. I'm pretty sure you won't regret it. Um, it is a decent movie. I did like it. Um, but overall, my expectations, I guess, were too high, which is why I left a bit disappointed, unfortunately. But I will try and watch it again with adjusted expectations, and hopefully I will have better things to say about it next time. And with that, let's go to Happy Time Murders. Now, this one should be very quickly, because I don't have that much to say about it. So, in case you don't know what this is about, let me read the synopsis. When the puppet cast of a 90s children's TV show begin to get murdered one by one, a disgraced LAPD detective turned private eye puppet takes on the case, which is that guy. And he has to team up with his former partner, played by Melissa McCarthy. And I'm personally a huge fan of Melissa McCarthy. I think, I think she's funny. Uh, first time I've ever seen her was on Gilmore Girls, and I thought she was absolutely cute and charming and just adorable. Um, with her, sometimes she makes a film... And I love it. Sometimes she makes a film and I'm like, what the fuck were you thinking? This one, unfortunately, falls into the latter category. Um, I don't have a problem with watching a movie uh, about puppets interacting with normal people. Um, I'm a huge fan of Peter Jackson's Meet the Feebles. If you don't know what that is, it's a film from the 90s. Um, it's like this one, an R-rated film with puppets. Uh, actually, I'm I'm not sure. I, I haven't seen this in a while, but Meet the Feebles, were there actual human beings in it? I can't remember that. I always thought it was a bit weird to have puppets and human beings interacting. Uh, I did. I don't remember growing up with Sesame Street. I I don't really don't really have any memories of that. But I find it really weird um, to have these interact. But that's not even the problem that the film has. 
the problem the film has is that it's just not funny. There are a few chuckles here and there. There was one laugh out loud moment which, for the life of me, I can't remember what it was, but there was one. But other than that, the film doesn't really offer much. Thanks, Strider. Thanks for watching. See you next week, maybe. You can watch the recording on the channel later. Have a good one. Hi to the US. Um, so overall, I thought this was a bit lackluster. It, the script just didn't really know what it wanted to be, what kind of movie it wanted to be. So on the one hand, you obviously you have a private eye who is a uh, senior mate, who, is, who used to be a former detective, who's disgraced and now is a private eye just trying to make ends meet and he's clearly not doing that very well. It's very cliched. You know, you've heard this story 50 million times before, just not with puppets. Um, so why make it puppets? It's just really bizarre. But I think this is a project that Melissa McCarthy and Falcone had, uh, Falcone who directed it and, and they co-wrote it as well. He, he works with his wife a lot and they've been trying to make this film for quite a while as far as I know. Um, so it sounds like this was somehow really dear to their heart. I'm not entirely sure why. Um, there's not a lot of fun in it. It's just really crude, crude humor and not crude funny humor. Like, I'm not necessarily a fan of crude humor. I'm not a fan of the first Deadpool either because it just felt so childish and infantile and just stupid, crude, below the bell humor. It's like, if it's funny, I can laugh about a fart joke, but it needs to be funny. If it's not funny, it's just bullshit. It's just crude humor that just failed to meet expectations. And this is unfortunately what the entire film is. You also have Elizabeth Banks in this, and I love Elizabeth Banks. And I was like, what you doing in this woman? Um, it was good seeing her, but overall, I was like, what are you doing in here? Maya Rudolph plays the assistant for the private eye. She's kind of cool the way that she deals with the stuff that's happening. She's a great comedic actress. If you don't know who Maya Rudolph is, you need to Google her. She's fantastic. She's fantastic in this as well. She does her usual shtick, and that is perfect. That's just, you hire Maya Rudolph, you get Maya Rudolph. You know, she does her thing. She's just deadpan and awesome and she doesn't have enough interaction with either the puppet or Melissa McCarthy. The few scenes that she has, especially with Melissa McCarthy, they're kind of funny. Those two together, they really work, and I like seeing them together. I think they need to make that work somehow. Um, but overall, it just feels like they're telling a story you've heard 50 million times before. There are a bunch of murders happening. They're trying to figure out who it is for the entire film. And it's obviously, really obvious, who the killer is from the first 20 minutes of the film or something. It is just so obvious and cliche and stereotypical and predictable. It's like your brain screams, I'm hurting. Um, and then you've got the showdown at the end and everything is just like, okay. It's not reviewing very well. Everyone is saying this is one of the worst films of the year. Potentially. Um, I wouldn't call it a waste of time, but I also wouldn't go out of my way to see this. It's not funny. If you want to see something funny, go and watch, I don't know, The Incredibles or something. It depends on what type of funny you're after. But there is stuff out there that's entertaining. That's Oh, how could I forget? If you want something funny, especially if you're a woman, go and watch The Spy Who Dumped Me. That is a funny movie. You can go and watch. I know Kermo didn't like it. Mark, call me. Um, but that is a funny movie. This, not so much. I didn't feel like it was a waste of time because it fit perfectly in between Black Klansman and the movie I'm going to be reviewing next, which is Alpha. But other than that, if you've got an unlimited card or any kind of like discount card and you get to see films for free, or you pay like a monthly subscription thing the way with an unlimited card, or you get a free ticket, you can go and see this. But seriously, I would not fork out 10 or 15 pound to go and see this. It's not worth it. Seriously, trust me. Um, the film is only, I think, one and a half hours long. It's not very long, but it does feel quite lengthy because there's not much happening in there. Um, it is crude for crude's sake. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's, it's lingering on things that it shouldn't really linger on because I'm not five. Considering it's R-rated, it has jokes in there that only a five or ten-year-old boy would find funny. 
so I thought overall it was it was a bit weird I don't exactly know why this was made maybe if the script was a bit more outlandish it, it could have landed but overall this is not something you really need to go and see at the cinema at all wait until it's out on Netflix or any video on demand platform or blu-ray or something like that don't fork out 10 or 15 quid for that it's not worth it um, Black Klansman put it into Black Klansman or and here's my recommendation of the week put it into Alpha because this is a great film. This is brilliant. I should have probably led with this considering we're already at three minutes to nine and uh, I want it to be done by nine. So let me tell you about Alpha because when we went to see this yesterday I just knew this film was new in the cinema. I didn't really know anything about it and I was like let's just go and watch it. I heard Mark Como talk about how amazing the cinematography is on their podcast on Friday but other than that I didn't really know anything about it. So the synopsis is in prehistoric past, a young man struggles to return home after being separated from his tribe during a buffalo hunt. He finds a similarly lost wolf companion and starts a friendship that would change humanity. That's quite a good synopsis. Um, I think it wasn't a buffalo, it was a bison, but whatever it was. So, this, like it says, it's prehistoric. It's prehistoric Europe, actually. Um, so people are not speaking English, people are speaking in some kind of prehistoric language and the entire film is subtitled. Now don't let that scare you off because there's not a lot of um, language, there's not a lot of speak happening. Speech is the word I'm looking for, there's not a lot of speech happening. Um, so you don't have to worry about being able to you know, keep track of what is actually being said. The one thing I have to say from the get-go, what Mark Hermod said on Friday, fantastic cinematography. Absolutely breathtaking cinematography in this film. You need to see this in the cinema and you need to see this on a big a screen as possible. Um, we didn't get to see this at the super screen because for whatever reason Black Klansman shows at the super screen at the O2 and I'm like, Cineworld, this needs to be in the super screen. Also because it's got Dolby Atmos sound and everything, right? This film looks and sounds fantastic. And this film, th this is how you have a tight script. This is how you condense all you need in, in, a, in a concise film, unlike Black Klansman. So there are, there are things in here. It's like, it's, it's about a young, young man slash teenage boy, right? He, he does this becoming a man ritual and his dad is the chief of the tribe or whatever. And he is taken on his very first buffalo or bison hunt, whatever, on his first hunt, right? So the men, there's like 10 men or something, they go out for days and days on end trying to hunt down some kind of, you know, some kind of meat for the tribe. And then they finally find the meat and they, they hunt it down and then something happens and something happens to the young boy and they think he's dead and they bugger off back to their tribe right but he's not dead he's actually like he falls down like a hill or something he falls down like a little crevasse and they can't reach him because they do not have ropes there's no such thing as rope they don't have such long ropes yet um and he he survives he wakes up after they've already left and he's obviously badly injured and he, he's alone in the wilderness for the very first time and he doesn't know what to do. He cries for his dad and all, but then, you know, you kind of have to get over it because you got to survive. And then he goes on this crazy, amazingly captivating survival journey. It is absolutely fantastic. You're with him all the way, like everything, like he stumbles, he falls, you're with him. And what happens is that he he comes across this wolf who's basically trying to eat him. And he wounds it with the only tiny bit of a weird, weird ass stone or knife that he can. So the wolf is badly injured, the boy is badly injured, and the boy manages, for whatever reason he thinks it's a good idea, to actually take care of this wounded wolf. And that is how everything progresses. And I don't really want to give anything away because that entire journey, that entire movie is just so amazingly beautiful. Not just shot, but also just the interaction. It's basically a young man and an animal for almost the entire film. 
against nature and against everything else. And it works. It works so well. I was so into that and I was so captivated by it and everything that they had to go through and even just like how they had to learn how to like work together, trust each other or not potentially trust each other. Um, it is just so well done. I was so emotional. See, that's what I mean. It's like I was so emotionally involved in this and that's why this is so powerful to me. Whereas Black Klansman, I was not emotionally involved, which is why I'm like, I will just tell you intellectually what I think of the film. Um, so this one, uh, basically starring this one young man, Cody Smith McPhee, and the film is book ended, uh, is is uh, narrated, book ended by narration by Morgan Freeman, which you will immediately hear. It's like, wait a minute, that's Morgan Freeman, but it's literally like a minute at the start and a minute at the end. So you can't even say the narrator because there's not really a narrator. There's one minute at the start and there's one minute at the end but it's literally all about this young man learning how to survive in the wilderness in prehistoric Europe by himself while making friends with a wolf <laughs> and it's the the only the only thing that I can fault this film for is that the wolf becomes domesticated or or tamed or whatever you want to call it a bit too quickly um, but it's probably not that easy to depict that properly I don't know but that was the only thing that I was like I don't fully buy it like I think if the boy is doing this now I'm pretty sure the wolf would have just bitten his hand off um, but it doesn't matter just just suspend disbelief for that particular bit and then you're fine and it looks fantastic and you're just with this guy and with the wolf all the way and there's stuff happening later that I like I said I'm not gonna spoil it it's just absolutely brilliant it looks brilliant it is so engaging I cried my eyes out not just at the end but also throughout the story there's like certain bits are happening and I'm just like I'm just a sucker for things and especially for like friendships and, and deep friendships like that and survival and and you know man and his best pal the little dog and I was like oh my god and near the end I just lost it it was just so beautiful it was really really good um, and it's it's one like I said this is this is actually the movie of the week if you've seen the poll on Twitter I was asking what people thought my my the most entertaining film was for me yesterday of Black Landsman, Happy Time Murders and Alpha and it was this one the one I knew the least about and that is quite usually the case because the more you know about something the more it shapes your expectations and I think that was the downfall for Black Klansman because my expectations were literally through the roof um, and there was just not no way for them f for the film to even meet them even remotely uh, which is one of the reasons why I think I'm gonna watch it again plus you vote with your money so you need I think we need to support films like Black Klansman any films with minorities in it we need to support that which even though why I think the film is not great it's just good or decent but I still think that I'm going to be supporting it a few more times just because I think that is important and um, so and so should you but overall if you want to go to the cinema and you want to see a really engaging story a story that will that will get you like right here go and see Alpha. If you like dogs and this whole relationship between man and dog, and I say man as in like human, um, it's just beautiful. It's just so beautiful, you know, and uh, it just really got to me. It was just fantastic. I mean, I don't have a dog, but I have to, I love dogs and, and this whole thing about companionship and man's best companion and man's best friend and the loyalty. And it's just, there are scenes in there just thinking of them now it's like there's small bits happening there just like a small look or a small action but it made me cry because it was just so beautiful and emotional it's really really fantastic and I love the prehistoric language in that as well it gave it some authenticity even though of course I have no idea if that language is is authentic or not like I I would not know um, same with um, I think it's supposed to be in prehistoric Europe, but most of these clansmen or these tribesmen, 
they look very Indian, uh, as in like American Indian. Um, because they, they don't look like Vikings, there's no blonde hair or anything, so I'm not sure if that's accurate. Not a single one of them had like light hair, but I'm not a historian, I don't know what's accurate. Same with the clothing, it seemed to be too sophisticated for something that is supposed to be 20,000 years ago. But like I said, I'm not a historian and it didn't bother me too much because you're too involved in the characters, the story and the struggle and overcoming the struggle, the challenges. And that is just so well done and everything is like in there's so many little details where like I had uh, the, the rating is 12a and I had a little boy next to me who might have been 10 and he was asking his mom a lot of questions but he was a really well behaved boy so he wasn't annoying or anything but there were things happening and he was like did he die did he just fall off the cliff and die and then there's something else happening in the film later that you know this what this film does really well is it doesn't tell you things it shows you like a film is supposed to do it's showing you not telling you because you're not supposed to tell if you can show it you show it because you're a fucking film right so one of the things that is obviously really important that you need to let your audience know nowadays we're at the top of the food chain because of our technology and our inventions and all of that stuff right nowadays a wolf does not pose a threat to us because we just take a gun and shoot it dead back then entirely different story and the film showcases this really well in like a 10 second clip there's the the tribesmen are around the fire it's in the middle of the night and the chief hears something and he's like staring into the darkness and he's like, oh no, I must have made that up. And everyone sits back around the fire with their backs to the darkness. There's not a single scout. And I'm like, what? And all of a sudden you see and hear, it's so quick you can hardly see it, a wolf coming from right, right side off camera into the circle, grabbing a full grown man and exiting with the full grown man dragging behind him through his mouth left of camera so it's literally like whoo, whoo, and it's like what what and everyone's like what the fuck what? or what whatever what the fuck is in prehistoric language and it's like oh what do we do well we can't do anything and in the distance you hear and the guy screaming and and then it's quiet and it's like well he's gone that I think it only takes like five seconds in the movie, but that already showcases to you that we're not at the top of the food chain yet. The wolves are our predators. We are their bait, you know? And I was like, that was so well done. It was a five second thing. Like if, if, if I quickly went to my bag to get, I don't know, look into my popcorn bag or something, I would have gone like, what happened? And you would have missed it. That's how quick it was. But it showcases this so well without telling you. It just shows you. And it was so powerful. And they do that before the boy um, has his little accident. And then you obviously know how dangerous the world is around him. He's, he doesn't have any supplies. He doesn't have any, any armor. He doesn't have any weapons. And he's out there and has to go back to his tribe and it's gonna it took them days to walk to where they were and it was just so powerful it was fantastic so yeah I love this film my movie of the week Alpha it looks fantastic it's engaging it's captivating it has you at the edge of your seat it's just you you could hear a pin drop in the cinema it was that engaging and funny enough this film was actually really well like the half the cinema was full of people I didn't think anyone knew what this was about we didn't really know what this was about so I thought that was really interesting that so many people actually went to see it. I really, really love that. Uh, so I think you need to go and check that out as well. If you like survival stories, check it out. If you like anything historical, prehistoric, check it out. It's really, really good. It's full of action as well. It's very endearing. So definitely check it out. And with that, this being my movie of the week, I'm just going to quickly jump into... Um, what's new on DVD and Blu-ray in a few days we're gonna get Avengers Infinity War on the third basically and Mary Shelley is coming out 
Uh, I missed Mary Shelley in the cinema when it was out, uh, so I'll probably go and pick it up then. Avengers Infinity War. <laughs> I've only seen it once in the cinema. I've actually not gotten around to watching it again, but I think I'm going to watch it again. Uh, it was a good movie. I can't wait to see the next installment next year. Uh, first, we're going to get Captain Marvel, then Avengers Infinity uh, the second part of Infinity War, which potentially could be called Endgame, according to some spoilers. Um, new on Netflix, here in the UK, obviously, um, Bad Moms is out. Uh, I'm only mentioning this because The Spy Who Dumped Me is currently in cinemas. If you like Mila Kunis and you like comedies with Mila Kunis, um, Kunis, I don't know why they always say Kunis, uh, Mila Kunis is in Bad Moms. The first one, not the second one, so the good one, is back on Netflix. Uh, check it out, it's really good. And also, in case you missed it, earlier this month, we, they put up Kubo and the Two Strings, which is a little animated film from last year, which is absolutely endearing, adorable and gorgeous. And it's a great story and you need to go and see it. So if you have Netflix here in the UK, check out Kubo and the Two Strings. And as I mentioned previously, Searching comes out in cinemas tomorrow, which is at the film with John Chu uh, about the missing daughter and the dad looking for his missing daughter. It's an absolutely brilliant film. It's one of my top 10 films of the year. I can't wait to see it again. I managed to see it a few weeks ago in an unlimited screening. Thank you, Cinema World! Um, it's really fantastic. It's, it's like Alpha. I didn't really know anything about it. There wasn't a lot of marketing around it. It's more like a, a feeling like a smaller budget film. I don't actually know what the budget is. And then it turns out to be an absolute gem. And it uses um, new technology or current technology and social media in a way that is absolutely fantastic. It, the film is shot through cameras that actually exist in your everyday life. So there's no, there's not someone setting up a camera and just shooting you while you're doing something. Uh, it always utilizes stuff like camera through a phone, camera through a laptop, FaceTime, CCTV, stuff like that. It's really cleverly done. Also the way that you can see how people are typing text messages and emails and what they, or, or what they type into a search bar in Google. It tells the story. It's all working for the narrative. So if you've not seen Searching, and you probably haven't, make sure you go and check it out. Uh, also, if, if you like uh, supporting minorities, check out Searching because it has uh, Asian leads, um, which I hadn't even picked up on while I was watching it. And afterwards, I was like, yeah, right. The dad's Asian, the daughter's Asian, and no one ever makes a big fuss about them being Asian. They're just people because that's actually what they are. So yeah, that's great. I'm going to potentially watch this before the unlimited screening on Saturday for Crazy Rich Asians. So I'm going to get like Asians and searching and then Asians for the Crazy Rich Asians. It's going to be an Asian day. I love it. Go and see these films. Support it. Support Black Klansmen. Even if you're potentially not as interested in watching it, give it a go. It's a, it's a really good movie. It's not perfect. It's not great. But it's important that you go and see it. The more people see it, the better. What is also out is uh, Idris Elba's new film. He's not in it. He directed it. It's called Yardi. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm planning on seeing it on the weekend. And I will tell you about it next week. And of course, Happy Time Murders is new in cinema as well. There's still awesome stuff in the cinema. We've got Mission Impossible. We've got Ant-Man and the Wasp, The Incredibles. Uh, there's a lot of really good stuff happening in the cinema right now that you could be watching. Make sure you watch Searching. If you're only going to watch one movie this weekend, make it Searching. Trust me on that. If you don't like it, at me at I Love Cinema Vlog on Twitter. Uh, that links to my private account on Twitter as well. Let me know what you're watching, what you think of it, what did you think of the other three films that I was talking about. Black Klansmen, Happy Time Murders, and Alpha, especially Alpha, let me know. Great stuff at the cinema at the moment. There's more amazing stuff coming out in the next few weeks, so stay tuned. Hope to see you guys again next time for uh, the next I Love Cinema. Always Thursdays, 8 p.m. UK time. Actually, I'm thinking about potentially going live on a Friday afternoon. I figured a lot of people are watching this on their mobiles instead of the computer. So I figured if you're in the pub after work, 
maybe that's a better time. Let me know what you think. Um, have a great time at the cinema. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. And now to figure out...